Been talking a lot about this book, Traction. Comment down below if you guys have seen it or read it or listened to the podcast. I've gone through it, I've done the exercises, and I can't emphasize enough how important it was to be able to implement the entrepreneurial operating system. It's called EOS. And our next speaker, Tom Bauer, is EOS certified, and he works with startups to Fortune 50 companies all around the world. He's bought, grown, and sold, sold small to large companies, and has wrote a book called What the Heck is EOS with the speaker, Gina Wickman. And he's gonna be able to help us today create that repetitive process to be able to help our businesses grow, make our lives easier, and be able to realize that system that they are creating. So without further ado, going to be able to introduce Tom Bauer. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Bruce, you can hear me just fine? Yeah, you sound great. Okay, awesome. Well, first of all, thank you to Print Hustlers for having me uh, here today, and thanks for all of you for tuning in. Uh, Ali, what an inspiring story that was, so that's really incredible. You know, I want to help you today really run a better business. So I'm going to show you the EOS model, but then I'm going to give you some real simple, practical tools that work. We've done this now with over 9,500 companies, and in every case, it's been very successful. To make sure our time isn't wasted together today, I'd like you to come out with at least one thing you can take away from this to start to run a better business that you can implement next week. There's no theory involved here. Everything is just real simple, practical tools that, that work. And you know, one of the reasons I know that it works is that our clients, on average, were about three to four weeks ahead of adjusting to our current kind of world environment uh, when compared to their industries. And I think that's a pretty powerful, powerful testament. So thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen and kind of dive into some of this stuff right now. I've got Bruce and both Becky uh, to funnel questions to me. So if you have any comments or questions, as I'm going through this, please uh, go ahead and uh, ask them while we're working here. So let me screen share. And I will go to this. And hopefully you can see that in just a second. Okay, we'll stop the screen share. And get back over here, all these newfangled things. And hey, Bruce, do you know if uh, anybody can see my uh, slideshow here? We tested it earlier and it worked. Yeah, there you go. You're ready to go. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Excellent. So I kind of did my introduction already and Bruce gave me a great uh, kind of intro there. Um, so I want to start by just kind of covering our agenda real quickly. I'm going to cover the EOS model. I'm going to go over the people, the vision tool, the people tool, and then the traction tool. You'll notice that there are more tools within this. There's about 20 in all for each of the different key components. This is the time and what I think are the most impactful tools that we can hit on today. As business leaders and business owners, you probably have experienced one or more of these frustrations, a lack of control. You just feel like you're not in control of your business. You're not getting the profits that you want. And I need you to kind of do a virtual, no way, when I say the next one, which is you're frustrated by your people. And so I know that that's uh, always a little bit, uh, you know, different there, but you know, a lot of times people are frustrated with, or leaders are frustrated with their people. You've hit the ceiling and you can't figure out how to grow or break through 
or nothing's working. And so our discovery about 15, 17 years ago was really this. To the degree that you can strengthen six key components of your business, all the other 157 things you're dealing with all the time just have a way of falling into place. And those six key components are these. At the center of our model is your business. And then the six key components are the vision component, right? How do we get everybody aligned on where we're going and how we're going to get there? The people component. How do we make sure we have the right people in the right seats? The data component. How do we make sure we're taking the anecdotal and subjective out of the decision-making process and boiling it down to really good hard facts? I know many of you have experienced a situation where uh, an employee comes up to you and say, oh, this happens all the time. It's a disaster. And it happened one time five years ago. And it's since been fixed. But in their mind, it's happening every day. The issue component. How do we strengthen the issue-solving muscle within your organization? And then the process component. How do we take that 80% that we need to systemize and make happen the same way every single time so that we can use our brains on the 20% that are exceptions? And when we talk about process, what we're talking about is high level, one to two page checklist, not ISO 9000 binders of documentation. It's process, not the actual procedures. And finally, I'll spend some time on the traction component. How do we get that cadence, that rhythm, that heartbeat going in the organization where we're just knocking stuff off weekly and we really are making progress and we can feel that we are taking little bites of the elephant every week, every quarter, and soon that elephant is gone. Now we can move on to the next one. We have a phrase which I'll probably repeat several times today. Fewer is better, less is more. It's the companies that try to do 85 things at one time that get into difficulty because there just aren't enough resources. So we really need to prioritize what we're gonna do, who's gonna be assigned to it, who's gonna own it, and what can we get done and what, what can we not get done? So I'll get into that here in a second. When we get into the vision component, we have a tool that I'd like to share with you called the Vision Traction Organizer. And if you've been doing podcasts or studying some of this, um, you know, you'll know that the first is our core values. So our core values are these. Be humbly confident. Grow or die. Do the right thing. Help first. Do what you say. And I hope that when you hear those, it kind of when we say do what you say. I mean, yes, is that accountability in some ways? But when you say to an employee, do what you say, it just resonates more. Now, core values define who we are as a culture and who we are as an organization. Peter Drucker once said, or at least is attributed with saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast. In other words, we can have the best strategy, but if we don't have a great culture, we're going to just kind of, you know, creep along and eventually die. The next section here is what's your core focus? What's your purpose, cause, or passion? And the way I like to define this for my clients is, why do you exist as an organization? We exist to help entrepreneurs find freedom, to help them get what they want out of their business. That's our purpose, that's our cause, that's our passion. Just to give you a couple of others, some you may know, some you may not, but uh, Disney, their purpose, cause, passion is to make people happy, right? Uh, King of Pops, which you're from it. If you're from Atlanta, you'll probably know as a popsicle. I guess you can't call it that because that's trademark. But they're a pop company, and theirs is to create unexpected moments of happiness. Now, um, Mary Kay, just one other example. Theirs is not to sell cosmetics, but theirs is to give women opportunity. Your niche is the space in which you play. Ours is to work with entrepreneurial leadership teams. What is the space in which you play? And how can you narrowly define that? The third is what's your long-term target? Now, I want to caveat this by saying um, this is really your big, hairy, audacious goal, as Jim Collins would call it, 
What's that long-term target that you're shooting for? Don't try and calculate straight line. Throw out something that's pretty crazy. So Alex and I, my business partner, we work with about 30 clients a year. Well, how did we get to working with so many? It's because it challenged us to say, what do we need to start doing or stop doing so that we can really hit our long-term target? Just needs to be a single measurable goal more than five years out. What's your long-term target? Your marketing strategy defines A, who is your ideal customer? Geographic, demographic, and psychographic. So geographic, demographic, and psychographic. Who is the easiest customer to work with that makes you the most money? What are your three uniques? What makes you different from all of your competitors? And I strongly recommend that you try and quantify at least two of the three of those, right? So that a lot of people will say customer service. Well, you know, go to your competitors' websites. How many of them say, well, you know, hey, we have a great product, but our customer service really sucks. Well, nobody's going to say that. But can you quantify it? Can you quantify that in terms of a retention rate or people that come back and order multiple times? So what are your uniques? And can you make them real by quantifying them? What is your proven process? Now, your proven process is just, and I'll show you an example in a minute. How do you visually explain what someone's going to experience when they work with you? How do you visually show what someone's going to experience when they work with you? It can be very simple, very high level, on white paper, doesn't have to have a lot of color, but it just says, this is what we will do for you. And finally, your guarantee. Some of you may have guarantees, some of you may not, that's okay. The guarantee is designed to take away your prospect's biggest fear. If anybody recalls um, in 2008, 2009, what Hyundai's guarantee was. Now think back to those times, um, people were losing jobs, they didn't want to make big purchases. And so Hyundai came out with this guarantee, which was, if you lose your job, we will take back your, your car and wipe out all your payments. I'll give you some rough numbers, so don't quote me exactly. The industry declined 11%, the auto industry, 2008 to 2009. Hyundai sales went up 11%. That's a 24-point swing in a pretty serious recession. So what is your guarantee? Third is, can you look at your three-year picture and define what that looks like? So looking out three years and now looking back, what would cause you to celebrate? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What are customers saying about you? What's the industry saying about you? But what does it look like and feel like? And put in those bullet points there, just five to 10, and it will help you set the next stage, which is if that's our three-year picture and that's where we want to be in three years, what are our top goals for this year? Now, as I said, fewer is better, less is more. Limit yourself to seven goals for the year and please make them smart, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely, right? Specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. For example, Example, implement a new XYZ system. Well, sorry, but that isn't specific because from my perspective, it was, hey, we've got it all implemented. Everybody's using it. The data is transferred over. It, everybody's rocking and rolling with it. You thought that it just meant buy the system. So let's make them specific and define what done really looks like. So what are your top three to seven goals for the year? We then break that down into a 90-day world. Rocks are nothing other than 90-day objectives. And you have company rocks, the top three to seven things the organization needs to do. And then you may have some individual rocks. Now, given the current situation that we're in, I have highly recommended to my clients that they really limit the number of rocks to the most key important issues that need to get solved in the next 90 days. We all know that there's a ton of stuff going on, um, but it could be 
PPP, increase sales by 10%, make 10 or 15 sales calls a week, reduce cost by X. You know, those are your top focus points for the next 90 days. A lot of other things you could do, what's most important, and then review those every week. I'll show you how at the end. And finally, what's your long-term issues list? What are the things that you can't solve today, but you don't want to forget about? You put those on the issues list, you pull them back up after 90 days and say, what are we ready to tackle going forward? You'll notice that what that does is it puts your entire vision down to 90 day rocks and issues in a two page document that you can then share with the rest of the organization. Now, some people are a little squirrely about sharing revenue and profit numbers. That's okay. If you're not ready to do that yet, then don't do it. Some of you probably already do it already. Some of you probably don't. Um, but share at least your overall vision as to where you want to go, the one-year plan, your rocks, and how your employees can help impact those things. Once we've done that, and here's an example of a proven process. 70% of people are visual learners. And so we start out with a 90 minute meeting. Do you like me? Do I like you? We then go into a couple of uh, foundational tool days and then we get into the 90 day world of quarterly pulsing. And by the way, if you've ever seen somebody work on a, uh, an annual goal, they start off in January, they're really excited spring break rolls around, I got plenty of time left in the year, all of a sudden it's 4th of July, somebody mentions it in August, there's a little blip, and it becomes October, November, and what does everybody say? Oh no, I have no time left to do this. So that's why we create the 90-day world, because what we have found is that after 89 days, people just start to lose focus. And so we break everything down into 90-day chunks. That helps us achieve more, it keeps us focused. If anybody has any questions on the VTO, feel free to type them in or to ask them or to make comments. And uh, Becky or Bruce will pass those on to me so I can answer them. The next question is people. How do you know if you have the right people? And how do you know if they're in the right seats? So we use a very powerful tool called the People Analyzer. And initially we start out with, you know, Joanne, man, she is humbly confident, she loves to grow, she's help first, she does the right thing, she does what you say. And we use a plus, plus, minus, minus system here. A plus is 90% of the time, Joanne demonstrates this core value, nobody's perfect, okay? A plus, minus is, ah, there's inconsistency. Sometimes she does, sometimes she doesn't, or in Martin's case, sometimes he doesn't do it at all. A minus is they don't do it enough. Do not overthink this. If you put all your people down and you put your core values across the top, it's very simple. 30 or three seconds, plus, plus, minus, minus. And you'll know right away that, um, you know, this person fits or doesn't fit your core values and your culture. Unfortunately, Martin here has three minuses and two plus minuses, which I'll explain the bar in a minute, but they're below that by a significant amount. Martin's been with you though for 10, 15, 20 years. He's one of your most knowledgeable employees and you've always been unwilling to kind of make a decision on Martin because of that institutional knowledge. Well, I'm telling you right now that Martin is a cancer in the organization and you need to get rid of Martin. And what will everyone else say in, you know, once that happens, they'll say, so that's important to understand that he is acting as a detriment to your organization. Now, Ellen is kind of mediocre. And our bar, our minimum standard for my company is three pluses, two plus minuses. And I want to say this twice because it kind of slides over once in a while. It is not column specific. It's just a collection overall of you need to have three pluses, two plus minuses, 
to be in my organization. Now, Ellen has three plus minuses and only two plus minuses. Is she salvageable with a little bit of coaching? Absolutely. She could take any one of those plus minuses and get it up to a plus very easily. But it is not column specific. Overall, three pluses, two plus minuses. But that just tells us, tells us if we have the right people that fit our culture and fit our core values. That doesn't mean they're in the right seat. So how do we know if they're in the right seat? We ask three questions. Do they get it? Do they want it? Do they have the capacity to do it? And you'll see this fits right in with the people analyzer. Do they fit the right core values? And, you know, do they GWC, as we say, do they get it, want it, have capacity to do it? So Wayne Gretzky, he got it. The neurons in his brain connected at a hyper level. Um, he was always playing the puck two moves ahead. He got it. Uh, your uh, front desk person who doesn't greet customers when they walk in the door, no matter how many times you told them, just doesn't get it. Do they want this role or do they just want a paycheck? Okay. Capacity. Do they have the mental, physical, emotional, spiritual skill set and time to do this job? Now you'll see that in Sidney Crosby's case, I hope you guys are hockey fans and are following this, but I grew up a big Red Wings fan. Um, he got it. He wanted it, but he just didn't have the capacity physically, mentally, emotionally, you can take your pick to really do the job. And that's tough uh, because everything else is pretty good. The question is, can your organization spend the time, the money, the resources to develop that capacity. Now, Steve Hansen, if you're familiar with the movie Slapshot, um, he just didn't get it. I mean, he wanted it. He had the skill sets, but the neurons in his brain were just not connecting at any level. When you do this for your employees and do it for yourself as well, um, you should have three pluses at a minimum and the get it, want it capacity is a yes or a no. They get it or they don't, they want it or they don't, and they have capacity or they don't. And with that, then, I want to move on to traction. I mentioned creating 90-day objectives. We call them rocks. I mentioned that they need to be specific, measurable, actionable, um, realistic, and timely. This is where you start to pare down what do we have the real capacity to do as an organization for the next 90 days? We pull all of that together in what we call our level 10 meeting. It's called a level 10 meeting because we want every meeting to be rated a 10. Now, I mentioned the 90-day world. We create a 90-day world where every 90 days we're taking our leadership team off-site and it could be two people, it could be eight people. If you have a smaller company, it could be everybody. It could be half day, it could be a full day. But we use that to step back from the business, take a deep breath, and really work on the business for a day as opposed to the craziness of all the day-to-day -day things that we're doing. I highly encourage you to do this. It is one of the most productive things you can do. And I know in some ways it may seem like a time suck, but trust me, if you start doing this, and as I said, we've done it with lots of companies, this is people's favorite day of the quarter. How do we get off site, work on the business, so we can dive back in for the next 90 days and work on the business? Now, when we talk about meeting polls, we have weekly meetings. Typically, they run about 90 minutes and I just virtually saw a whole bunch of you cringe. If you do this the right way, it will cut down on a lot of other meetings that you currently have. Secondly, if you spend a 50 hour work week or more, I'm asking you to spend 3% of your time on a weekly basis with your team working on the business. Now, if you need to do it for 60 minutes and that works better for you, fine. Um, if it's twice a week and you spend 30 minutes. Uh, but I found that 90 minutes is the appropriate amount of time, again, depending on the size of the business um, and how many people you have. 
It's on the same day every week at the same time. It starts on time, ends on time, and it has the same agenda. We start out with good news. So good news is just everybody check in. It's kind of a segue to take us out of our day-to-day -day craziness and get our minds and mental status set for the fact that we're going to work on the business as a team for the next 90 minutes. One piece of personal and or professional good news that gets us going in the right direction, sets a positive tone, and also helps the team get to know each other. And that's really around building great team health. We then go over our scorecard. So hopefully all of you have a scorecard that contains just a handful of numbers that are leading indicators that tell you if your business is going up or going down. If you don't have a good scorecard, please read the scorecard chapter in What the Heck is EOS? It explains it in very simple terms. You should be able to come up with a good scorecard in about 45 to 50 minutes with a whiteboard. Just put up a bunch of ideas. Tell us, is this actionable? Does it mean anything? Do we need to see it or not? Is it a good leading indicator? And then take that and remember two things. Your scorecard will change over time. You'll be adding numbers on and taking numbers off. The thing that prohibits people from having an initial scorecard is they're trying to make the perfect scorecard. Don't. Just understand that it will change over time. If you start out with five or six numbers, great. Five or six is fine. If you end up with 16 or 17, great. Start with those. Just remember that it doesn't have to be perfect. The second is that your number doesn't even have to be perfect or at least accurate. I had a client that was a restaurant in Colorado Springs, and their labor cost as a percent of revenue was 33%. Now, every other restaurant in their group was 20, 21%. So they're off by a pretty large margin. And the GM said, well, Tom, I don't get my payroll from corporate for six weeks. True statement. I said, but that's another issue. How can we approximate if you're getting better or you're getting worse? And he just kind of stared at me. So I said, well, do you have a POS system? He said, yes. I said, so you get revenue every day? He said, yes, we do. And I'm thinking, well, that's half of the equation. And I'm waiting for the penny to drop. And after about 30 seconds of silence, I realized that the penny's not dropping. And so I say, well, do you have a POS system? Yes, we do. We get hours every day. And I wait another 30 seconds, thinking that at some point here, the penny's got to drop and it doesn't drop. So I say, so you get hours, you know, how much do people make? Well, they make anywhere from six to $12 an hour. I said, perfect, we're gonna use, or six to $18 an hour, perfect, we're gonna use 12. Multiply that by the hours on the time clock, divide that into your revenue, and you've got an approximation. He said, but it won't be accurate. It doesn't need to be. Directionally, it's gonna tell you if you're getting better or getting worse, and I said, frankly, you're so far off the mark right now, you need all the help you can get. And so I have clients that track things with tick sheets. Are they going to miss one once in a while? Sure. But at the end of the day, will it tell us, you know, are we headed in the right direction? You bet. We then review our rocks. Now, how do we do both of these in five minutes? Review our scorecard and review our rocks. It's because people are allowed to say three things. On track, off track, drop it to the issues list. Anybody can drop a number down or a rock to the issues list. Say they want an update. And I say, hey, my rock is on track, but you want to know more about it, encourage people to say, drop it to the issues list. We do not get into discussion during the scoreboard or the rock review. It's simply on track, off track, issue. That leads us to customer or employee headlines. Is there anything that the team needs to know about customers or employees that's not already on the issues list that we just want to make people aware of? Don't let this turn into a 15-minute discussion. If it starts to get past two sentences, drop it to the issues list. 
We then go over our to-dos. Now, your to-dos are not all of your to-dos from the last week. They're the promises that you made each other last week. Typically, they come out of the issue processing, or as we call it, IDSing, identify, discuss, and solve. What most organizations do is they do very little I, really big D, and very little S. I know you've been in meetings and experienced it when, you know, we talked about an issue and then a couple of months later, we're still talking about the issue. And a couple of months after that, we're still talking about the issue. Well, either A, you're not driving towards action or B, you haven't identified the real root cause. So when you get to an issue, really identify what is the root cause issue? And I always use Sally as an example. So my apologies if there's someone on the call today named Sally. But, um, you know, sales in Atlanta are slow. Okay, why? Well, you know, did I tell you how much I really like Sally? She's just a great team member and is always helped. No, wait, back up. Why are sales in Atlanta slow? Well, you know, I mean, Sally, no, I don't want to know that. Why are sales in Atlanta slow? Well, Sally's missed her numbers for the next or for the last couple of months. Okay, so tell me, is it a capacity? Does she not have the skill set? Has she not gotten the managerial support? Has she not gotten the training? It's going to end up being one of a couple of those things. And eventually, the manager admitted that it was a capacity issue. He'd spent or she'd spent, you know, months out there trying to help Sally. Sally just wasn't cutting it. Okay, now we can get to a decision, which is a to-do. Are you going to talk to her in the next week or am I? It could also be that she just didn't have the training. So, okay, I want to see a training plan from, from you, Bobby, and I want to know what her training plan is for the next 90 days. That's going to be your individual rock. So we drive towards action. One other note on issue solving is that it may very well be that you don't have the information you need to solve the issue. Then assign a to-do for somebody to come back next week with all the information. We don't want theory. We don't want speculation. We don't want to discuss things forever and ever. If you don't have the information to make a decision, assign somebody to come back next week. And you'll find that your IDSing will go much, much more smoothly. The only other thing I want to say about that uh, is that if you find yourselves going down rabbit holes, we start out with sales in Atlanta and we end up talking about business cards in Phoenix, Arizona. You need to call a squirrel and isolate those issues and get back to what's the real issue we're trying to solve right now. When you have five minutes left, what you want to do is conclude. And when you conclude, you do three things. You recap the to-dos that came out of the meeting today. Again, it's not your individual to-do list. It's all the things that you, know, you need to uh, do in the next week that you all agree to. To-dos are your promises you made to each other in this week's L10 that you're going to do by next week, or at least within 14 days. You talk about any cascading messages. Are there any key messages we need to send out to the entire team? And are we using the same language to describe those? And finally, you give yourself a score. Scale of 1 to 10. We call it a level 10 meeting because we want every meeting to be a 10. Did you start on time? Did you end on time? Did you IDS well? Now, I'll give you a little nugget here. You're not rating yourself on how well you can do a year from now. It's did we do as well as we could today? Was this an hour and a half of valuable time for us to spend together? That's how you rate the meeting. Scale of 1 to 10. If you give it a lower number, that's perfectly fine. But please give feedback to the team. Hey, you know, we started five minutes late because everybody wasn't here when they were supposed to be. I have a rule with my team, and that is, or at least a saying, um, early is on time, on time is late. And by the way, that's from Vince Lombardi. And so I tell people, look, if you need to get a cup of coffee, if you need to get yourself organized, get there five minutes ahead of time because we will start on time 
and woe is the person that shows up late. That's not acceptable. Did we end on time? Okay, the last thing we want to do is keep discussing and discussing. We set aside an hour and a half. When that's up, it's up. We end the meeting, we can pick it up next week. Your goal is not to solve every single issue on the issues list. It's to solve the most important items. You can pick the others up next week. You've only got so much time in a week, so don't overload your schedule with commitments and promises. What do we need to get done now? What issues are most important to solve? And let's go forward from there. I want to tell you one other thing as I move on. I've seen this work with three-person three, three person companies, and I've seen this work with companies that have 10,000 employees. It doesn't matter the size of your company. This works for everyone. You can adjust it. You can tweak it. But we know that this works because these are time-tested, simple, practical tools that work. At the end of the day, and I only shared kind of vision people and traction a little bit on issues and a little bit on data today. But if you go to Traction, the book, or if you go to What the Heck is EOS, which is kind of the um, Reader's Digest version, if you will, all of these are covered and they give you simple tools to start to get going on this. I am available for any questions by email, by phone, by text. If you want some of my time for free, I am happy to give that to you to help you wherever you're struggling. So I want to make that offer as I wrap up here in my last minute before we get to Q&A. So that's my email address. That's Becky, my assistant's email address. And with that, I'll turn it over to see if we have any questions or comments from anybody there. Thanks so much. That is awesome. Guys, you can drop in your comments about this. Um, down in the comment section, and we will pull those up. One of the questions was, will the slides be shared? I'm assuming so, Tom. Unfortunately, they're proprietary to EOS Worldwide, and I can't share the slides. However, what I will say is if there's any of those tools that you want, whether it's the EOS model, the people analyzer, the level 10 meeting agenda, please email becky at profitworksllc.com and she will send you soft copies of those. So I can't give the entire deck. I can share the very specific tools that we mentioned. You can also ask her for a sample scorecard as well, um, or the IDSing. Okay, awesome, we'll have that. Um, somebody said they missed your contact. We'll drop that in the comments below your email so people can copy and paste that. Tom. Um, it's, one second, it's, it's very easy. My contact is Becky at ProfitWorksLLC.com. Becky at ProfitWorksLLC.com. That's yep. be in the um, comments below so that everybody can take a look and be able to reach out to you as well. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. You know, EOS uh, was something that I have been a huge fan of and we've talked about in our Printavo Print Hustlers podcast for a while. Me and you actually had a podcast which went longer than we expected, but I love talking about it. <laughs> I must say that what really worked well for us is the goal setting at high level. We, instead of breaking it quarterly, did monthly, I think maybe because everything's a little bit more in flux right now. Yep. But you talked about breaking those goals into more simplistic, achievable, like a couple of them per department, and then one owner for each KPI that we review every week. I, I really am a huge believer of that. So um, guys, for those who are listening, definitely pick up Tom's book, What the Heck is EOS? Pick up Traction on Amazon. Those both are the books that are there to be able to help set up your EOS system. Now is the perfect time. Yeah, it really is. And um, two things on that. Um, the first is that just because somebody owns a rock or owns a number on the scorecard doesn't mean they only work on it themselves. You know, they're eliciting lots of other help. So for my rocks, for example, Becky gets 80% of them and she does 80% of the work on them. And then I do the last 20%. And so you think about your job owning a rock or a KPI is to really, um, make sure it gets done. It isn't to do all the work. 
The second thing, um, you know, I, I mentioned is that uh, this is a perfect time to start to use some of these tools and instill a little bit of discipline in the organization. What I did with my teams right when they started this was to really look at, okay, what are the most critical path items you need to handle right now in the next 30, 60, 90 days? And, and Bruce, exactly what you did, what we really looked at was, okay, let's make them shorter. Let's make them fewer. And what do we need to do in the next 30 days? Well, we need to apply for PPP, or we need to do X or Y or Z. And then we broke those down. So great comment there, Bruce. I 100% support that. I think it also took us a couple months to really get in the flow. Is that normal or how long does it take? I mean, it took about a month to actually set up all of these goals, but then another couple months to get everybody circled around this. And we're still iterating. I mean, I feel like every six months it's almost completely changed now, but is that about right or what can people expect? Um, have you ever done the exercise where you fold your hands and then somebody talks for a little while and then they say, okay, now put your other thumb on top. Or you can do the same thing with folding your arms and somebody talks for about five minutes. Now fold them the other way. It just feels awkward. Mm. And, you know, and that's what change is. And so just remember that you're going through change here. It is going to take some time to get used to. Um, I think that your objective should be progress, not perfection. So as long as every week you're getting a little bit better and a little bit better, um, I do think that if everybody walks in prepared with, a, with what they think the top, you know, two or three rocks are, and then you can put them up on a whiteboard, you should be able to get through those pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, again, we don't want to discuss them. We're not trying to solve something. The rocks are designed to be solved over a 30, 60, 90 day period. But usually what I see is that within a month, companies are getting a big bang out of the tools I shared with you today. Mm -hmm. And then within three months, it's really starting to just roll. And if I were going to start somewhere, I'd probably start with Rock's scorecard in the level 10 meeting. And then I'd get to some of the nice vision stuff down the road once you've got those things in process. So don't try and tackle too much, but get Rock's scorecard and the level 10 meeting started. Got it. Awesome. Thanks so much. I think you named your next book, Progress Not Perfection. Uh, that could be one of them. Actually, we're doing one right now that should come out in a month or two on uh, – incentives and it's really about how to use incentives to you know enhance employee engagement uh, and to really drive business results in creating a positive culture so i think that'll be pretty interesting but yeah um, i like the idea of progress not perfection as a book so you get some royalties off that which if i split mine with you will probably be a penny a piece <laughs> perfect awesome right. thanks again tom all right thank you very much and please email Becky, my assistant, and uh, if you have any questions and just need some help, my time on the phone is free. So please go there. All Absolutely. right. Absolutely. Thank you much.